Okay, um, well thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for, for welcoming me here tonight. Um, I'm really outside my comfort zone because as Brian said I'm one of those introvert scientists that like to inspect the top of my shoes a lot um, and so um, I don't find uh, speaking terribly uh, easy. Um, but I will stick to script because uh, as was said I've been involved with the college for a long time and there are far too many stories that could be told um, and if I go off on a tangent, um, um, you'll be here until tomorrow morning. So I'll try to keep the script as much as possible. Um, as, as Brian said, my background is uh, as a Defence Research Scientist and uh, with the Defence Science and Technology Group, which is what it's called now, at Edinburgh. And um, I work in infrared surveillance. It's not that secret, Brian. It's, it's, it's infrared stuff. Um, and with my extensive college uh, involvement with Trinity College, um, People often believe that I actually work for Trinity College, um, but the duties that I have performed for Trinity um, have all been voluntary. Um, that's the term I like to use. Michael Hewis used to call it amateur, but um, I prefer voluntary. Um, and indeed, all of the positions on the uh, College Council, or the board as is, as is now known, are voluntary, uh, with the exception of the head of the college, who is a full member of the board. Um, as also as Brian said, I've got five adult children and all of those attended Trinity from reception through to year 12. So I had children at the college for 24 years um, and I joined the College Council uh, in 1991 and retired from it as its chair in 2014. Um, all these things considered, I've been involved for 26 years of the college's 32 year existence. and. Uh, um, I was not involved during the tumultuous early years, um, which I will illustrate soon, um, um, as this was a time of great uncertainty, uh, enormous faith, um, significant disagreements, um, and considerable austerity. Um, it's also a bit strange that the college is 32 years old, that's it, I mean it hardly qualifies as history, um, but um, I'm sure everybody can remember back 32 years, uh, and yet that's when Trinity College started. Um, and anyone who has spent any time living in and around Gawler will be aware of Trinity College. Um, besides its massive and rapid growth in just over 30 years, Trinity has at times had a divisive impact on the community, um, and this has been regrettable. Notwithstanding all of this, uh, Trinity College currently has 3,696 students, mm -hmm. makes it the biggest college in the Southern Hemisphere, and some 700 staff on its payroll. And uh, these staff are spread over three sites uh, at Evanston, Blakeview and Anglevale, uh, and also includes the staff at Starplex. In this presentation I'm going to focus on the high level governance, and you may wonder what that's all about, the governance aspects of the college, uh, and that's the area that I've been directly involved with. I'm not going to cover the management of the college um, for two principal reasons. First of all, the management of the college has always been the domain of the headmaster, or the head of the college as is now known, and not the domain of the board. So even as chair, I would only have a very small insight into the day-to-day -day running of the college and all the myriads of management matters that staff dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely impossible to get across all of that, as you can imagine. Secondly, the magnitude, the size of the management of the college is huge. Aspects of the management of the college, besides such important things as managing the staff, uh, running six schools, and includes other aspects such as the sport, the music, the drama, the extracurricular activities, uh, year-level camps, the China trip, the snow trip, just to list a few. Each of those aspects could amply fill an entire presentation such as this. So my scope limitation of just dealing with the governance aspects does cover how the college was grown and strategically developed and the reasons that underpinned uh, the decisions to grow uh, the way it has. I should also point out that uh, I'm presenting this view of the history of the college from my perspective and I'm abundantly aware that if six people saw the same event that they would each have six different views of what actually happened. No doubt different people will interpret aspects of the college's history uh, differently from the way that I perceive it. Uh, so be it, this makes for interesting dialogue. So, Trinity College was not the first or even the second Anglican in educational institution in Gawler. Um, um, in, in 1850, um, Mr. I.S. Burton opened the St. George's Day School, 
um, with 130 students uh, from in and around Gawler. It had a good reputation for educational uh, quality and changes to the uh, funding of education with the State Election Act of 1877 saw the school close down after just 27 years. The Church of England um, Gawler Grammar School was established in the early 1900s and was located in Walker Place, just close to Murray Street. Following these, uh, these the education, uh, Anglican education went into recess until during a Christmas sermon um, in 18, uh, sorry, 1982, the Reverend John Kinsman uh, it suggested the concept of a new parish school that could be opened in Gawler, and a group of the parish elders uh, took on the vision and held a public meeting at the Gawler High School Library on the 6th of June in 1983. Support for a new school, uh, although tentative, was sufficient to get the ball rolling, and in July a notice uh, was submitted to the Commonwealth Schools Commission of the intent to open uh, a new school in Gawler. Um, as was to become a habit in the early development of the college, parishioners uh, assisted in the, prepa uh, the preparation of making the parish hall into uh, a classroom. And the parish hall was the original location of Burton's um, new uh, old school. Um, as you can see, uh, this is um, Father John Kinsman uh, out the front of the, um, the parish hall as it is now. And you can hardly read the label, but the label actually says Trinity College Gawler. And so here, some of the parishioners were getting stuck into cleaning up the parish hall and making it suitable um, uh, as a classroom. So Trinity College opened um, on the 7th of February uh, in 1984 with 27 students. Uh, the teachers were Tina and Peter um, Hatchett and they were assisted by part-time staff including a secretary, a librarian, a teacher's aide and a music teacher. During the year the numbers grew to 38 um, and the early days of the college owe a lot to the Hatchets who considered this year more of a vocation um, because they were only paid minimally um, and they had quite adverse conditions to work in. The college commenced with a, a vision of um, a college of excellence open to all in a disciplined, caring, Christian environment and its motto is In God is My Faith and these vision and motto remain today. With the parish hall as a temporary uh, location, Father Kinsman also had the vision for, a, for his small parish school growing from R to 7 um, in 1984 when it started to R to 12 by 1989 uh, on a new site. So during this year, uh, the first year of the college, um, John Strange, the secretary of the committee, um, Jeff Gordon was elected chair um, of the College Council at the college's first AGM and the college also secured funds through guarantees from parents and various other contributions uh, to acquire 50 acres of land at Evanston. Finally, the College Council sought the assistance of Dr Tony Schinkfield, uh, who was the chair of the Anglican Schools Commission, to assist in appointing a headmaster for the college. And Michael uh, Hewitson was appointed as headmaster to commence in 1985. At this time he had no classrooms, no government funding, few students and the legal status of a little R7 school in Cowan Street. There was a lot to do uh, on the Evanston site. A classroom block had to be built as well as a house for the headmaster and uh, the uh, the cost-effective modular pine logs, which became a, a trademark symbol of Trinity College, were used and racing against the clock for a start at the beginning of 1985, it was again all hands on deck and a lot of voluntary work uh, was put into getting the college ready. Now these are empty sites of the Evanston site which look very different now. The dusty paddock, uh, as it was known, uh, was beginning its transformation. During the construction uh, of the College at Evanston, uh, Michael Hewitson was busy seeking new enrolments and seeking registration of the new school, same name, new location, um, and seeking some government funding and of course seeking some staff <coughs> that were prepared to work for probably minimal because there was no government funding. By some miracle the, um, the classroom block was ready for the start of 1985 
Um, and the staff were utilising second-hand furniture that had to be sanded down first and second-hand books for all of the classrooms. Even the chair of the college council, Jeff Gordon, had to spend some nights sleeping in the new building to guard the new appliances uh, that were delivered before the building was locked up. The headmaster moved into his log cabin residence on the site with his wife Ros and their four young children uh, even before the power and water were connected because the classroom block had higher priority. Day one at the new Evanston site uh, consisted, uh, started in the usual fashion as all schools at Trinity uh, start, um, 40 degree February day, um, tradesmen still making the finishing touches to the classrooms, 189 students and not a blade of grass. And the boys were in white shirts. <laughs> Midway through 1985, with students from reception to year eight, the number of staff had grown to nine and the expectations on the staff were substantial. Christian teachings had to be an integral part of the curriculum and not a simple add-on. The staff had to uh, work over their school holidays and were paid a living wage, is how it was called, as the college was still waiting for government funding. Michael Hewitson uh, had quite strong views about parental controlled schools. Their success rate was not particularly good and he had first-hand experience of some of the pitfalls that uh, parent-controlled schools had. The style of governance uh, adopted was uh, for the College Council to look after the fabric of the college and the desired tone of the college, and it was to be determined uh, by the parents of the students that were also members of the college uh, according to the Constitution. Michael had a very simple guiding governance principle and that was the headmaster was responsible for anything dealing with staff, students and curriculum and the council could take care of the rest. As is the Anglican way, um, tradition is very important and the setting of traditions of the college commenced almost immediately. The patronal festival of the college, that's Trinity Sunday, uh, was set aside as an open day where children's work was on display and special performances from a very early college band were held. The Archbishop, uh, Rayner, officiated at the first Trinity Sunday celebration shown here and supported by local clergy and members of the College Council outside the first little tin shed. The pioneering spirit of the members of the college was very strong as the direct benefit to their own children could clearly be seen. Working bees were very well attended and I can remember Michael Hewitson compulsorily forcing everybody to put the shovels down and have morning tea, which was amply catered for by the parents and friends group. With enrolments growing to 249 students in 1986, the second classroom block was built, and as the demand for places at the college continued to grow at a great rate, the differences between Father Kinsman's vision of a small parish school and Mr Hewitson's vision of a larger, more financially secure college began to emerge. The founding parents struggled to regain control over their little parish school, but the Archbishop's decision to encourage the development of a diocesan college and not a parish school saw that founding vision evaporate. Unfortunately, this saw a number of the founding families remove their children from the college. An early criticism of Michael was that he was trying to establish a St Peter's of the North. Um, um, it is true that many of the concepts uh, for Trinity were borrowed from St Peter's. After all, it was Michael's old school. Um, but these were ideas that had significant merit, um, namely things like the uniform, the importance of the appearance of the grounds, and the house system. Trinity was never set up to be an elite school, and the open-to-all policy uh, was evidence of that. In 1986 also saw the construction of the Big Shed uh, up on the hill and the Big Shed uh, hosted the 1987 Trinity Sunday Open Day. At this time the number of staff had grown to 30. In 1989 the college saw its first Year 12 class that had grown up from um, reception to 8 up to reception to 12. And at this stage, the structure of the college uh, included uh, a two-stream reception, um, 
to uh, year six, a two stream intake at year seven, leading to four streams in year seven to 12. And upon reaching that milestone, um, the further development versus the consolidation argument started to emerge. Um, the college was growing very fast, people wanted things to slow down. And uh, with the, his small parish school vision shattered, Father Kinsman resigned from the college council uh, in that year. Uh, we have, uh, I think uh, Michael Hewitson was a, a glider, and uh, we got a lot of these photographs uh, uh, from overhead during the development of the college. You can see the difference, even just in a few years, uh, two years between the two buildings that were um, the two buildings that were built, the headmaster's residence up here, and then the first classroom block. And already down here, this is the headmaster's house here. That was the original block. The big shed's here, and two more classroom blocks are here, and some courts. So just in two years, that's what was developed. The college uh, community had long sought for a spiritual centre for the college. And the college was aware that this would be an expensive undertaking because the college had to pay for it in its entirety. Uh, government funding, which was flowing in now, um, was not allowed to contribute towards religious buildings. And a public appeal was launched to raise, um, to raise funds. And the Board of Home Mission and Evangelism actually um, loaned $100,000 to the construction of the chapel uh, because it was to provide a home for a college-based experimental congregation on Sundays. Um, construction commenced in 1990 and the College Chapel and Fine Arts Centre was opened by John Duncan in 1991. The experimental congregation of St Francis also commenced worshipping in the chapel and Father Alan Courtney was its first priest. The term experimental was used as this type of congregation was not part of a typical diocesan parish uh, it's only relatively recently that the experimental label has been removed and the congregation is now recognised under the parochial ordinances of the diocese. Back to the college itself. As uh, of all of the college, uh, as all of the classes continued to fill, Trinity passed the 1,000 student mark in uh, 1990 and the waiting list began to grow. This situation did not sit well uh, in the community and became another divisive issue. Some of those who wanted a place for their children at the college were definitely disappointed if they missed out on getting a place. Again and again the headmaster would reiterate that uh, we were not meeting our constitutional obligation to be open to all uh, if we had a waiting list. The college was in fact open to all, you only needed to enrol your children at birth to guarantee a place. <laughs> Michael even distributed flyers to the maternity section of the hutch, notifying new mothers of this fact, and the waiting list continued to grow. It became abundantly clear to the College Council, as it had been for many years in Michael's mind, that another campus of the college had to be established. If we don't do it, someone else will, Michael would say. This was considered by the Council uh, a very risky venture, but they proceeded to acquire land next to the Craigmore High School in Blakeview. The trademark log cabins, classrooms, or general learning areas, GLAs as they are called professionally, were built on the site on, and on uh, day one of uh, uh, 1991, the Blakeview campus of Trinity College opened with 230 students completely filling every class in the Art of Seven School immediately. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kevin Whittington was the inaugural head of the Blakeview campus, which grew over the next three years to become an R-10 campus. By now, the, uh, the process of applying to register a new school had become more complicated, and almost as soon as Blakeview campus opened its doors for the first time, another application was lodged to open another R-8 campus adjacent to the existing Gawler campus. This new campus was designed from the outset to have the same structure as the Gawler campus, starting as an R-8 campus in 1993 and growing to an R-12 campus in 1997. Naming the new campus uh, needed careful consideration. Being co-located with the original Gawler campus, but slightly to its south, it was called the South Campus. Very imaginative. Um, and the Gawler campus was renamed the North Campus. So now you know. If there was any mystery about which was the North School and the South School, you now know. 
That was the deliberation to get those names. Um, Dr. Michael Slocum uh, was the inaugural head of the South Campus, which opened in 1993 with 376 students and 20 staff on day one, and it also was full. He was determined that the South Campus would not be a clone of the North Campus, uh, but develop its own culture and specialisation. So there were things that were specialised on South School that were different to North. I can remember this time on College Council quite vividly. Um, apart from the usual meeting formalities, sorry, I'm not keeping up with these. South Campus, another building, lots of buildings, and the South. Um, uh, apart from the usual meeting formalities of the College Council, the reception of the minutes and the finance reports, the business usually followed the headmaster's report that contained information about the developments around the college and the recommendations that, recommendations that required council endorsement, such as the construction of a new building. At the uh, traditional Trinity Sunday celebrations, there was always a new building to dedicate and I can recall five buildings being dedicated in one year. An anecdotal story exists that at one time the council resolved to build a new classroom block the day after the foundation's report. <laughs> Michael Hewitson had a unique style about the way he executed his duties as the college headmaster and its CEO. He was meticulous in his planning and knew what had to be done in order to develop the college into a financially sustainable entity. He had an uncanny ability to keep all of the pertinent financial figures in his head. On today's standards, the staff of this time would have to admit that the conditions and resources were austere. Staff had definite demands placed upon their commitments to the college with respect to sport team uh, supervision on weekends, extra activities um, after school, and the college maintained its pioneering culture with massive parental support, support and extensive use of volunteers and honorarium staff to keep the costs down. Following the opening of the South Campus, the administration of the college needed a new home and free up some space on the North Campus in which it had been situated since 1985. At this time also, Mr Hewitson removed himself as the head of North Campus um, and, uh, and became the headmaster of the college and appointed Mr Kim Reynolds as the head of North Campus. A new administration building incorporating a new library was built adjacent to the chapel, as can be seen here. The library was named after Roma Waite, a parish parishioner of Gawler and an early librarian for the college. In 1994, after 10 challenging years as chair, Jeff Gordon stood down and Dr Rupert Thorne took over the reins of the college council. In that year, uh, the student enrolments passed 2,000 uh, and, uh, the two, and cries for a slowing down in the pace of development and growth came from all quarters. The Montessori preschool had its humble beginnings in a classroom on South Campus and then in 1996 moved to the original headmaster's house following the construction of a new residence for the headmaster. Two other residences were built at the college, originally for the chaplains of the college and Michael maintained that a permanent presence at the site was a deterrent to unwarranted intrusions and general college ground security. In 1998, the College Council commissioned a college review and appointed Drs Tony Schinkfield and Vivian Ayres to undertake that evaluation. It was deemed a responsible step in the development of the college and an opportunity to have a first independent look at how the college stacked up against other educational institutions. It was an extensive review um, that was overall quite complimentary about the college's development. This review also recommended that a period of consolidation might be wise. Although the headmaster took some of the criticisms in the report to heart, the College Council enacted nearly all of the recommendations over the succeeding years. As a direct result um, of this very frugal fiscal management, the college was able to embark upon the development of probably the college's largest infrastructure development. A public meeting of the parents of the college was held in the college chapel to discuss whether the big shed should be expanded. Um, uh, the, big, the big shed was still uh, the place where the annual Trinity Sunday service was held and the college had grown to such an extent 
that even spilling out onto the adjacent tennis courts, there was no more room and the visitors were vulnerable to the occasional wet Trinity Sunday. The other alternative was to build a new facility on land that had been acquired on the other side of Alexander Avenue and for it to be designed in such a way that the entire community could fit under cover. The attendees at the meeting resolved that the new facility was the preferred option and the planning immediately commenced for the construction of the sports, training, arts and recreation complex known as Starplex. In his usual entrepreneurial style, Michael utilised the architectural skills of one of the college chaplains, the Reverend Chris McAleer, to produce concept diagrams for the pool, gymnasium, theatre and the courts. Building and running Starplex was a large financial risk. The college did not need to go into debt to pay for it, but there was concern about the ongoing running costs. The college appointed Dale Martin as the Starplex general manager, and he is still the general manager today. He and the headmaster undertook considerable research into like community assets around the country in order to develop a model that was financially sustainable. Notwithstanding all the running costs and the ongoing pressures to keep it fresh and up to date, the facility is certainly an asset, as the community would no doubt agree, not only to the college, but also to the wider community, which has always made itself available. Throughout the development of the college thus far, the low fee objective of the college that enabled it to be open to all was only achievable through the level of federal funding it received. This level was determined by the calculation of an index called the Education Resource Index, or ERI, which effectively took into account the proportion of the total income of the college that was met by the parents' fees and other sources of income. The college bursar, Mr Wayne Smith, was instrumental in modelling all the possible outcomes from a range of financial possibilities and was the only living person I knew that actually understood the ERI equation. <laughs> At this time, all campuses of the college were assessed as level 10, which attracted a relatively high level of federal funding. The maximum was level 12, which of course is the level of the Catholic school system, um, and the level that enables that system to maintain low fees. Another aspect of the funding process was the preference by the federal government to deal with systems, school systems rather than individual schools. One school system could be established for each religious denomination in each state. A minimum of three schools were required to make a system, so as a stroke of genius, um, the three campuses of Trinity College, since they were all registered with the state government separately, became the necessary basis for the South Australian Anglican school system. The advantage of this was that the system was assessed in total to determine its level, its funding level, and any subsequently opened new schools under that system would adopt the level of funding of the system. And early in 2000, the South Australian Anglican School System received the great news that it had achieved level 12 funding, the same as the Catholic school system, from the federal government. A financial fact that set the future of Trinity College on a far firmer financial footing. And despite the consolidation recommendation in the Ayers and Sheepfield report, this consolidation was realised by, guess what, the development of another campus at Angle Vale. That's consolidation. That was financial consolidation. <coughs> and prior to this decision, a number of alternate sites were considered, including Kadena, Westlakes, Kapunda, and even the Salisbury College of Advanced Education. And when it was being sold, was considered as a possible campus for Trinity. The site at Angle Vale, near the intersection of Angle Vale Road and Heaslip Road, was a virtual wasteland at the time of purchase, um, but in the usual Trinity style, it was cleaned up, and the signature Trinity classrooms were built uh, in a phased-in manner. The Open Learning Centre was established just for this purpose. The, the Open Learning Centre, yeah. and uh, students from Year 10 onwards were able to tailor a vocational education program that suited their desired future. An award-winning vocational education and training program was established, or as we call it, VET. 
After 17 years at the helm of Trinity College, Michael Hewitson retired as the headmaster in 2001. A lot has been said about Michael's style of leadership, from autocratic to ambitious and visionary. It could also be said that uh, we could not do today things that were done during those early days of the college. And as is regularly acknowledged, the fact remains that Michael was an appropriate pioneering leader to have during these formative years of the college, despite the number of toes he must have trodden on. In 2002, uh, fresh from the Frankfurt International School, Trinity College welcomed Mr Luke Thompson as the headmaster of the college, and he inherited a college that was debt-free, had $3 million in external assets, and had a current, recurrent a surplus budget. Luke's expectations of the College Council, however, were very different from those of Michael and supported the modern models of governance that were drawing wide acceptance uh, in the not-for-profit sector. Taking over the reins of an institution such as Trinity from its founding headmaster was a significant challenge. The College had grown to a size that a mere mortal could not possibly contain all of the intricacies of its day-to-day -day operation, and a new level of devolution of authority was needed. After an appropriate amount of time to check out the college in its entirety, Luke proposed a substantial strategic reorganisation. The structure of the college, the structure of the college uh, that it had grown into, comprised two out of twelve campuses. That's north and south with Blakeview and Gawler River as R-10 feeder schools. The Open Learning Centre was a separate entity arranging vocational training for students and the Montessori Preschool provided early learning for three to five year old children. Luke Thompson proposed a completely new model with North, South, Blakeview and Gawler River all becoming R-10 schools and the development of a senior school for years 11 and 12 which would take all the graduates from the four out of ten schools. The Montessori Preschool continued unchanged, but the Open Learning Centre was reintegrated into the senior college, expanding its offerings and offering hybrid academic and vocational opportunities for the senior students. This structure brought with it many benefits that were appreciated by the parents, the most significant of which was a return somewhat to the smaller school environment with each of the out of 10 schools having around 850 students, but with the benefits of the facilities of a far larger college. The senior college benefited from the economies of scale and was able to offer 49 SACE-based Year 12 subjects as well as the VET program. That's an offering of subjects that no other school can do and it's purely the economies of scale and the numbers of students. This restructure and the need for a senior college and a new administrative administration block also brought with it a significant amount of debt for the first time in the college's history. The debt was manageable to the tune of about $17 million and there was a plan to trade out of it or whatever part of the debt the college wished. Financial advisors actually criticised the college for having no debt. A strange thing I know, but since this implied that current students were funding the facilities um, for future students and not getting the benefit themselves. Whereas if you go into debt and get the facilities now, the current students can make use of them while they're paying for them. That's the logic. Mm. The governance uh, at the college also had to adjust to the new style of the new headmaster. The governance model um, uh, of John Carver, uh, as described in his book, um, Boards That Make a Difference, uh, was important in understanding the College Council's role in the not-for-profit educational sector. During my first reading of that book back in 1995, I was struck by the number of guiding principles of modern governance that the College was not adhering to. With Michael Hewitson as headmaster, he had a sound understanding of what the role of the College Council was and he provided most of the material that the Council had to consider and approve. Luke Thompson had a different understanding and rightly expected the College Council to provide the overarching guidance as to the nature and ethos of the College that they wished to maintain or establish. This is exactly as John Carver had described 
and the role of the college council who, as representatives of the membership of the college, the parents had to maintain the college in the manner that they wished. The governance structure um, of the college um, was established as shown. The members of the college, which are all the parents and those that pay their $2 annual fee, um, are the highest level of the college. They appoint the college council. The college council then appoints the head of college, which actually, who actually becomes part of the college, and that is the only person to whom the college council deals. The head of the college then is responsible for all of the staff of the college. And uh, that model works very well. There were only, there's only a couple of little links around this. Um, the bursar of the college does liaise with the treasurer that's on the college council. And that's the only one of those little deadly triangles in this management structure that works quite well. This model certainly was not in place in the early days of the college when there was much friction between what the parents wanted and what Michael's vision was. During this time also, the constitution was reviewed and made up to date with the current structure of the college. It was, after all, developed for a small parish school and was now a very large multi-campus college. It was revised to include gender-neutral terminology and the titles of the senior leadership were adjusted. What were once campuses became schools and their heads became principals, and the headmaster became the head of Trinity College. In 2004, I took over from Rupert as the chair and continued to develop an appropriate governance model for the college. The Carver model focused a lot on policy, uh, with the stated aim that this should be written down, made public, and debated to get it right. The belief was that there should be no second guessing on how the college council would vote on any issue as the policy was quite open about this. If surprise rulings were made, then clearly the policy had to be updated, as it was unclear. Carver was also very sceptical about the roles of subcommittees, who believed, uh, he believed that they could take over the authority of the council. And of particular concern generally is the executive subcommittee, which can turn into a pseudo board if you're not careful. The role of the executive subcommittee at Trinity was solely to prepare the agenda and the business papers for the next council meeting, and that was a suitable role for the executive. Another benefit of the college's new structure was that it freed up the head of the college to focus on wider issues that impacted the whole college and put some serious thought into the development of the college. Luke adopted some of the principles of Jim Collins's board, um, Good to Great, which was an interesting read about the companies that actually go and become truly great because he had very great uh, ambitions and, uh, and ideals for the college. In the new college structure, authority to run each school was devolved to the school principals, which at times was quite a challenge. Each school had the autonomy to run themselves, um, however they still had to substantially remain in the Trinity mould as so far as uniform, curriculum, um, and uh, many other aspects. The operational executive of the college comprised the headmaster and his deputy, as well as five other school principals and the directors of the Montessori. And this formed a pretty formidable body of educational professionals with a collective educational experience base of many, many years. This provided an advisory base or a sounding board for the head of the college that continues to prove to be a very powerful asset. New ideas and programs could be trialled in one part of the college or two different methods tried out at two of the schools and the best solution could be adopted across the whole college. This time of chair, uh, as chair gave me an insight... Oh, I'll get off that one. This time as chair gave me insight into the critical importance of the relationship between the head of the college and the board of the college, and in particular the chair. The chair meets weekly, at least, with the head to discuss, or really simply to be made aware of, operational matters that will not necessarily get presented to the, to the board because they're not of a governance nature. I found it also vitally important as an opportunity to ensure that the well-being of the head was being looked after. It was during one of these fireside chats that Luke told me that a particularly high-profile Adelaide Independent College had approached him 
with a view to taking over the leadership of that college from the long-standing retiring headmaster. And sure enough, whilst I was in Denver in Colorado on business one afternoon in 2009, I received the call from a Sydney-based headhunting firm who delivered uh, the bad news, well, bad news for our college. Uh, this now set the wheels in motion to undertake the most important task that a board must do, and that is to appoint a new head. If the board gets this appointment wrong and appoints the wrong person, the work of the board can become very hard and unfortunately very nasty. If you get it right, the council can continue, the, the college can continue to flourish. The current head of the college, um, uh, Mr Nick Haightley, commenced in 2010, coming from the position of head of the senior school at St Peter's. Nick maintained very high visibility around the college, gaining a first-hand insight into the operation of this massive institution and slowly getting the understanding of all of the things that the college had to offer. Being mindful of the debt situation, Nick actually advocated against any further capital investment, concentrating on, would you believe it, consolidation. With the strategic plan put in place by Luke Thompson concluded, the College Council were keen to keep the momentum up and commence the development of the next strategic plan, one that moved the College forward and provided the new head with an opportunity to have ownership of the next stage in the College's development. That would be looking five years ahead. It was up to the College Council to specify the strategic priorities that it saw as being critical for the future preparedness and the ongoing improvement of the College's reputation. Ten strategic priorities were proposed around which the head of the College could develop operational programs that moved the College forward in each particular aspect. The ten areas that were selected as being very important to the Council were Christian values, the opportunities that are offered by the College, excellence in teaching and learning, wellness for students, wellness for the community, and wellness for the family, the staff culture, environmental sustainability, and of course financial sustainability, and enterprise development. They were the ten strategic priorities. With this guidance, Mr Haightley then developed his five-year strategic plan, going from 2013 to 2017, finishes next year, comprising 26 actions each year spread amongst these ten strategic priorities. Earlier this decade, the College received gratefully the Building the Education Revolution Grants, the BER funding, that you would have seen massive building going on around the place. And that enabled each of our Art of Ten schools in the College to move forward capital development projects that would otherwise have had to wait for funding. And funding was a commodity that was scarce under our debt <coughs> repayment plan that the College had. New sporting facilities were built at Gawler River and South Schools and new replacement classrooms blocks, replacing some of the older log cabins, were built at the North and Blakeview schools. In 2014, after what appears to be a traditional 10-year term, uh, I stood down as chair, um, and Dr Ken Heath took over the chair's role, having been the deputy chair for the three previous years. The one that I skipped over there um, is a chart of the enrolments of Trinity College from its start in, in 1984 to this year. This is the annual August census, which has to be reported to the federal government. And you can see um, certain things, certain leaps when Lakeview was open, another leap when South School was open. Um, and then you can actually see this rolling off. And there's been an increase in enrolments every year for the last 32 years. Mm. Although 19, uh, sorry, 2015 had 3,695 and it's one more this year. <laughs> so in closing now, I'll provide just a few significant elements that I believe have facilitated the successful development of Trinity College. Firstly, I believe that the college had the right head uh, that it needed at the right time, and the college developed at a critical time when this type of education was being sought by the community. One of the most important skills of a head of college is the ability to select truly excellent staff. And Trinity has always been blessed by a dedicated, professional and caring staff. The college also developed its capital assets within its means. And although this meant cost-effective log cabins, 
for classrooms, they did the job admirably and the college did not overcapitalize. The college was developed with a community that was also passionate that it should succeed and eventually adopted a governance model that should keep the college sustainable well into the future. So these are some shots um, of the college now. Um, quite a far cry from the dusty paddock that it started, um, with the area outside of the library in the top right, and the Roma Waite Library with the chapel in the background at the bottom. Um, the creek which passes through the middle of the college is now lawn um, and areas of uh, synthetic grass. Sport is still very important and there is a significant agricultural component at the college. And, and finally, um, uh, the ovals on, um, on South School as well as the, um, um, the path and the, and the lawns and the memorial garden around the chapel. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the assistance provided in sourcing all of these pictures from Wendy Stimson, who is the college archivist, and the development office, um, and also Joe Statton, the, the long-standing head's executive assistant, and thank you very much for your attention this evening. There must be questions. I mean, after excellent address. Oh, no, Paul, please. <laughs> I won't. All except Paul Barton. Paul, you have um, a question. Just, just curious. Uh, what was Trinity College's involvement in uh, uh, restructuring or assisting Endeavour College at Victor Harbour? What was that all about? Just to repeat, yeah. repeat the question. Yeah, uh, the question was, what was Trinity's involvement in Investigator College at Victor Harbour? Um, yeah, um, th this... Um, as, this is one of these stories that I thought, will I put that in or will I leave it out? But the thing you've asked, Trust you. um, the, the Archbishop asked the college, um, because there was a college down on the south coast called Glendale, Christian College, um, and it was in financial difficulty. It was going broke, basically. And he was approached by the then Premier, um, Brown, I think it was? Dean Brown. Brown Dean Brown, um, uh, from that area, um, to actually approach Trinity uh, to see whether they could do something. So Trinity College um, sent some people um, down, looked at the way the uh, uh, Padere Christian College was being managed. Um, and it was, the situation was, and it's a dilemma that the college is in, it's a Christian college, but at the same time it's a business. And those two things don't necessarily get on too well. Um, many debates I have with the bursar of the college, because he says, well, if it wasn't for the finances, you'd be broke, there won't be a college here. And so when you get things like, what do you do about people that are in debt? You know, um, do you forgive the debt? Is that the Christian thing to do? Or what about the people that pay their fees? It's a very difficult argument. You've got to be hard-nosed to a certain extent. And unfortunately, Glendale's problem was they couldn't be that hard-nosed. Any teacher that couldn't really perform in the classroom went to the library. So they had massive library staff and had huge staff that they couldn't really afford. Now, there was a, a, an assessment that was made um, and... The recommendation from the, uh, the treasurer was don't touch it with the barge pole. And so with that recommendation, the college unanimously uh, resolved to support it <laughs> and basically <laughs> invested $3 million, um, which was a very risky business, to get uh, Glendale up and running. It had to change its name, so it became the Investigator College. If you're ever down at uh, Goolwa on the road in from um, um, Strathalbyn, you'll see it on the right entering Goolwa. And it's got another campus over near the Bluff Road, over in Victor Harbour. It looks just like Trinity, uh, same colours. Um, and, uh, but there were a lot of provisos. Um, Trinity College provided uh, the majority of the uh, members of the board. Um, our bursar at Trinity took over all of the financial arrangements uh, of limits in order to safeguard our investment. Um, probably in, in 2013, um, the, the school... Uh, well, the school picked up almost straight away. There was a new headmaster appointed. Um, and in 2013, that $3 million loan was repaid in full. So um, uh, it was one of those really risky things, um, you know, that you really put yourself out on a limb as a board member, saying, you know, the, the, the membership of the college at any time could have said, what are you doing lending $3 million to this college down here? Why isn't it going into our college? And that's a very difficult question to answer, and, and, and against the recommendation of the Treasurer. So uh, that was another one of those real leaps of faith. And uh, it, uh, it, it, with, with sufficient safeguards, it, it turned out OK. Other questions? 
Yes, Dan. <clears throat> I've uh, read a book called From Dusty Paddock. How much uh, should I pay attention to that? <laughs> this is why I preface my remarks about interpretation of what I saw happening. Um, um, it, Dusty Paddocks was the first history written in 2004 um, and, uh, by, uh, by John Daly, who was a historian at Flinders. Um, and he did a lot of research, and the facts in there are, are, are quite accurate. Um, I think um, Michael was very fussy about certain things, and I think to some extent Michael released his book, um, which was to some extent about um, an, an appeal to government about an appropriate way to arrange an education system. He, he um, used Trinity a lot as illustrations of what could be done, um, and to a large extent also he used this to correct what he thought were some inaccuracies in this. So um, yeah, they're both very good books and, uh, and I drew upon them in getting some of the facts right for this presentation. So yeah, they're both very good books. And one thing I didn't mention also is this was the, uh, the college yearbook in, uh, nine, in 1988 when my daughter first started. And this is the 2014 <laughs> college yearbook, um, significantly different. Other questions? Paul again. Um, is, it, is it true uh, Michael Hewitson was brought to Gawler to decide whether the, the school should go ahead and he said no, it won't work. But the, uh, uh, the Anglican, uh, the group, they said, well, you've got to make it work. Did it happen like that or is that...? Um, I, I'm not aware of that. Um, I, I am aware that he, he came with a lot of schools. Um, there were some pretty stringent um, requirements. Um, and considering what they had to work with, like nothing, um, uh, he came with a lot of school. He worked in, in the uh, public education system over at uh, Wyala. He was a school teacher. He, he ran the um, Salisbury Education um, Centre at Salisbury CAE. He also helped the founding of uh, a Christian school uh, in, the, in the hills. So he came with a lot of, um, um, a, a lot, a lot of uh, the skills necessary to do this. Um, I, I'm not aware that he um, sort of took up the appointment under sufferance, but of course it, it was not an easy appointment to take up. Yes. Bruce? He, he was running a radio station yeah. from Salisbury, mm -hmm. which provided quite a degree of information to the community, with a lot of uh, different uh, individuals brought on, on a nightly basis oh. to discuss various aspects of education. Hmm. He's had a very long involvement with education. That's where I met Michael for the first time at the at the uh, that centre at Salisbury. What got you interested in becoming a board member? Um, I guess it was an exciting place. Um, I had a uh, a long involvement, uh, you know, ahead of me when, mm. when my first child um, um, started. Um, as a matter of fact, she started before my fifth child was born, um, and. Uh, and I, I, was, I was keen to actually um, be part of um, making sure that it would last. I, I was very invested in, in its survival and making sure that it had, was, was sustainable. And uh, that was the thing to want to keep involved in it, I guess. And, uh, and what was your reasoning behind sending your children to Trinity College rather than the public system? Just, uh, just on yeah. a first um, The first I ever heard of Trinity College was um, from our parish priest. I was living at Williamstown at the time. And uh, um, our parish priest uh, said at church that uh, a new school is opening. Um, and uh, um, our daughter was one then. You know, so it was just one of those things. And I guess um, you, know, you don't think of schooling for your children when they're one. But um, uh, that was... It, it became available, basically, and, and there were limited choices. Um, the local school, our kids went to the Williamstown CRC um, and then went to Trinity at reception. Um, but yeah, that, that was, uh, it was just an option that we decided to take. And we got sick of driving from Williamstown to Gawler and back three times a day, so that's why we moved to the big smoke of Gawler. And what, what activities do the, the students uh, undertake that are not normally in public school or whatever. Um, what was, was Trinity famous for as far as extracurricular or...? Um... 
I think there's only one sport that Trinity doesn't do, and that's rowing. Um, and the water's a long way away. Um, and, uh, but that's one of the things um, that, that Michael did do. He actually got Trinity involved in the, in the inter-school um, sports competitions. Um, they basically participate in every inter-school sport or activity, chess, debating, um, uh, as, as it is, um, as I said, with the exception of rowing. There was no rowing. Although we did have a row on the Barossa Reservoir at one stage, but uh, not to be. Tony. Seeing you're an orphan school, how do you work out school fields compared with St. Princes and Saints, the, the private schools? Yes, the, um, the, the July meeting of council is always the meeting of council where the, the fees are debated. And, and that is always a tricky um, one because um, Trinity College is a low fee school. Um, it claims to be that. We have the statistics to say that of all of the schools, independent schools in the state, Trinity is in the low 10%. Um, the cost of educating, um, the cost to the government of educating a child at Trinity is about $7,000 per student, and that comes from the federal government. Uh, very little fed, uh, funding comes from the state government. Um, and uh, so th this is about, um, when it comes to the balance sheet, 75% of the total income of the college uh, comes from government funding and 25% is parents' fees. Um, and so it, it is a, a significant proportion and we're always trying to keep them as low as possible. What actually happens is the bursar uh, has run through a whole lot of models. He comes, presents to council uh, a number of options um, and uh, we made a mistake one year of not putting the fees up at all uh, because, I mean, the fees are, are complicated. There are the fees that you pay out. Then there is complicated by sibling discount. Uh, your second, third, fourth child gets a discount. So that comes into it as well. Um, and there are also um, uh, early payment incentives and discounts. So if you actually um, trade all those off, in one year, the fees themselves didn't go up at all. But the sibling discount reduced a bit and the discount for early payment reduced a bit and that made up for it. But we pay dearly for that because to keep up with the costs of running the place, the fees have to sort of go up with the costs of running the place. Otherwise, you go, you go broke. Um, and that one year where we didn't go up but went across and then up again, you never, ever make that up. And so when times get tough, and, and times are tough, the economics of, um, um, of the area um, and, uh, and, and in general is actually having an impact. Um, there are a lot more schools around uh, now than there were, and so um, um, you know, Trinity College, as big as it is, does feel that impact. And, uh, and with, a, with a growth of only one last year, you can actually see that impact uh, is having an effect. But it is a driving thing to keep those fees as low as they possibly can be every year. And then once the fees are decided, the bursar then takes those fees and works out the budget that gets presented in the October meeting of council. Mike Denison first. There is a subsidiary organisation associated with Trinity that's uh, helped to advance quite a number of activities. Mm. Yes, there is, uh, and I should, this is another one of these items that I would like to have mentioned. The college has a foundation, and, and Bruce was the, was the founding chair of the Trinity College Foundation, um, and it's a, uh, it, it's, it, it's a collection of, um, it, it raises funds for students that can't afford the fees or can't participate in activities because of the cost um, and it basically supports and tries to establish that open to all attitude. The foundation is growing really well, it has great functions and fundraisers during the year um, and uh, is, is a great asset to the college. Of course foundations, if they've been going as long as some of the city colleges, are quite well established. Um, the foundation at Trinity is working quite well and growing steadily and really making a difference to some students that otherwise wouldn't have that opportunity.